Uh, hello and uh, welcome to this uh, show called City Sense that we've been hosting on NewsClick uh, since October 2. Uh, and what we're trying to build is uh, to understand the whole concept of uh, how cities are being built, evolved, the challenges that exist in the cities. Uh, and right uh, from, from Latin America to different parts of the world, and of course, our own Indian cities and towns. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, uh, Romy Khosla, uh, from whom I have, in fact, learned a lot in this stint of urbanization. And Romy uh, perhaps requires no introduction. He is, uh, by profession, a uh, trained architect planner uh, who has built a large number of cities across the world, and uh, especially uh, the war torn uh, cities of Bosnia Herzegovina, and uh, was quite instrumental into building. Uh, plans of uh, some of the towns, mountain towns in uh, Himachal and also Ladakh, that's lay. Uh, so with Romi, what we're going to discuss is, you know, the whole question of why is it that the Himalayan towns require an altogether different paradigm approach? And why is it that month after month, we are experiencing disasters taking place? And the recent one, that is in Uttarakhand, where the Uttarakashi Tunnel uh, uh, where, where 41 people have uh, still not been evacuated and are there since last two weeks. And it is said it may take another few weeks uh, uh, for us to evacuate them. So so what is the flaw in the current model of urbanization? Or do we require a new definition that Romy really uh, speaks about, uh, that it's not just the classical definition of census in statutory towns, it has to go beyond that. And there's another very uh, interesting thing that Romy talks about, and that's what we are going to discuss with him is he talks about a separate institute to understand the whole process of uh, mountains and urbanization in the mountains, and he calls it the Institute of Montology. What kind of Institute of Montology? Is it just one central or every state should have such, such institutes? What would be the role of uh, such institutes? Who will govern such institutes? And what could be uh, a desirable outcome of, of such institutes if we build? But the bottom line and the silver line is that the current model of urbanization or the current model of development in the mountains is, is unsustainable. Over to Ron. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tikinda. Um, I think what you have uh, precipitated a discussion on the mountains at this particular crucial time is very important because you see when when a series of crises takes place then it is an opportunity for all of us to rethink uh, because we have the future in front of us and we really should learn lessons from our failures in the past now most people imagine the city uh, sense to be a city in the plains i mean let's not forget when you talk city in, in, first of all you conjure up in your mind uh, a metropolitan city, a city. Uh, today, we will discuss another aspect of a city, another kind of city. Um, and uh, it's the ability to have some kind of appreciation and sense of settlements in the mountains, which mistakenly we call cities because mountain settlements do not form the kind of city that we generally imagine in the plains. And not only that, the academic and research and teaching component of cities uh, around the universities and institutions focuses on plain cities. Nobody talks about mountain cities. So it's a vacuum. Um, so let's call this discussion today mountain sensibility. We are having sense about mountains. <laughs> okay. and I place before you, yeah. I place before you three arguments I'm making. There are many arguments. There's a lot of discussion on mountains, but I like to place to you three arguments. Because I'm speaking in one way to the mountain folk also. We are all mountain folk. We, I was born in the mountains. I was educated in the mountains. I lived in the mountains for many years. So I'm, I'm well aware of the fact that uh, we, have, we have got a completely different sensibility uh, about our settlements when we sit in the mountains. So I have also noticed the kind of problem that mountain folk have that when they are in touch or come into contact with plains people who arrive there for various reasons, 
there is a sense of a sense of inferiority which is uh, comes out of the place people as if these are slightly backward people as if they're slightly bore uh, uh, poor people slightly uh, living in a dream you know the real life is where we come from there is this kind of undercurrent and i want but, to but but from you apparently that is also true for the no not that that is legitimately true but why i'm saying apparently true because if you see this whole constitution debate the constitution assembly yeah. then even the constitution it doesn't speak about mountains it only speaks about forests okay as a utility so i think it all evolved from there i mean i mean what were you trying to say i think it's absolutely true this is yeah. kind of set into our psyche so i would like to propose that actually we mountain people are more advanced than plains people because we know how to live how to how to respect our culture respect our sense of environment our relationships the mountain people's relationship with the environment is of a much higher order than it is in the plains so i would like to argue from that point of view that mountain sensibility is a much higher level of consciousness and we should not uh just imagine that the mountain people are lesser people so my first argument is let us first understand how we can deal with mountain settlements now you see about 12% of our uh population uh, stays in the mountains so they, you know they they are settled so we i am proposing a completely so that's across the globe you're talking about across, across the globe it's 8% yeah. in india but yeah. it's 12% globe Yeah. now i i'm proposing uh, a different form of description of uh, mountain settlements i like to call them sparse settlements let's say that the urban city in the plains is a dense urbanization because you see the, the idea of a city implies that there is a boundary you know when we talk of city we talk of boundary generally a municipal boundary or something but cities don't have boundaries anymore even the plain cities don't have they are urban conventionally we had two distinctions urban rural but today with the with the electronic media with the cars with the um, finances and the facilities and the shops coming we are now in a situation where we have dense urbanization and we have sparse urbanization Nobody so, Romi, what 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 you're trying to say is to get rid of the conventional, uh, you know, uh, uh, the dichotomy or the definitions that we have, the census towns and the statutory towns. So, yes. what you're saying is far beyond that. Yes, I don't yeah. think we can. I am using the opportunity of all of these uh, sad occurrences and accidents happening in the hills to rethink the fundamentals of our knowledge of how we take for granted. our human settlements whether they be in the cities or in the mountains so in the mountains since we are talking about that today i'm saying let me first call it sparse urbanization now as soon as i say this i will say uh, uttaranchal himachal nagaland these are urbanized places but they are sparsely why should we so, so that's very interesting just just i mean that's very interesting i mean just all those who must be watching the tick for example 2011 census it terms that himachal is uh, just 10% urban but yes. what you're saying it's not like that it's complete, i mean it's it's a different definition that you all and what do we get out of it suppose if we if we build that definition well first of all the the whole idea that rural area is backward rural area is only agricultural now when we take the settlement pattern in himachal you do get a city or a dense urban settlement like uh, let's say like simla but when you go beyond simla which is a governmental center and which was a colonial town so there is an origin if we look at himachal settlements which are not colonial they are sparse urbanization because today which road do you not get run over by somebody driving crazily in the hills going to the villages the villager is going to the shops in the towns and going back he is using tractors in order to convey his agricultural produce to the market now these are not rural behaviors these are urban behaviors he is arguing he is taking money he is selling so we have to forget it we have to just talk about sparse urbanization um so therefore i'd, I'd like to su- suggest that mountains are sparse and we need to change the way we look and the more important part is the way we are going to study 
And I have some very important uh, issues here regarding um, how to study. Um, the second part that I would, the argument that I would make is uh, with the Plains people, I'm having this conversation. Let's say we are mountain people talking to Plains people and we are saying, listen, we are very fragile in the mountains. You don't take us for granted. These are not places you can just create. Uh, there is an obsession about creating vertical infrastructure. Go up to Simla, go up to Musuri, go down to this, take a cable car because there is no horizontal infrastructure in, 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 in the mountains. It's only vertical. Everything is vertical. In that process, we we take, we take do horizontal infrastructure and we make a tunnel. <laughs> we have accidents. All right? So we have to really see we have to study this. That we uh, we have to study it in the in 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 our mountain studies. That you know, do we need horizontal infrastructure or vertical infrastructure? Cable car is much less uh, damaging than a tunnel, for instance, yeah. or a road for that. Matter. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So what I'm saying is, let's take a take a, a, a typical subject like infrastructure. Where in the cities we talk about infrastructure, we take it for granted. In not in mountain areas, you cannot take infrastructure for granted. You have to design it to suit it for the particular needs of the mountain. You see, the, the mountains, uh, the our mountains which stretch from Indus to Brahmaputra is about 2,500 miles. Now, a kilometer, sorry. And there are 11 states. I, I can't remember them offhand, but I'll say. 11 um, states and two UTs. Yeah, yeah, 13, so all together. Right, 13 all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, these, these are, for me, uh, very special places which mm -hmm. require, which have the responsibilities for their mountains. Mm -hmm. They live in the mountains. And I am going to suggest that these mountains should be treated like gold mines. Everybody okay. wants something out of them. <laughs> they want to suck the power out of them. Yeah, they want yeah. to suck the minerals out of them. Yeah. They want to suck the agriculture out of them. That's so, what the British did. And we continued the same pace. We want to carry on. In in fact, we, we, we have we, become, in that sense, microcolonial because the planes are taking. <laughs> you see, let us look at a simple subject like water. The entire indo gangetic plain is watered from the mountains. So we have a huge responsibility. We are the guardians of that water. We cannot sort of, we send pure water, mountain people send pure water to the energetic plain and it is hugely polluted. So we, I'm saying that, you know, this kind of distinctions, new ways of thinking about what is happening to um, water, what is happening to power, you cannot, you, you, you generate a lot of power, but sparsely urbanized centers don't require huge power consumption. We do not have huge industries in the mountain. That means the power is all getting taken away. So there has to be some sense of um, asset management by the mountain people. That these are our assets. These are our inheritance. These are our gold mines. Hello, hello. We are not offering it. So, so Romy, this is very interesting. I mean, what you're suggesting is a completely new architecture, both financial as well as governance. Yes. And since you are so passionate about settlements, so <laughs> what is it? I mean, I mean, when you say asset management, I mean. Yes. How do you visualize it? You know, because we have a very top bottom approach right now yes. of asset management. So, what do you think think of it, especially from a mountain urban settlement perspective? Look, let's let's take an example that uh, we have an option to generate electricity. Right. Mm -hmm. One option is that we can put up solar cells in the plains. Let's say that's three times more expensive than putting a hydroelectric power. Mm -hmm. I would uh, I would ask the mountain people, can we take your power away? Because if I say, if the mountain people say no, I'm sorry that what you are going to do to our mountains in order to generate these dams, you just go and do the solar. Huh? Hmm. Yeah, I'm managing yeah. my assets better because I don't need my landslides. I need yeah. to preserve my agriculture. So in yeah. that sense, it's the same with water. Mm -hmm. It's the same with water. You can't just build a dam and you know flood half the stuff here and take the water away because drinking water is not there in Delhi. So I'll yeah. say, well, <laughs> listen, settle less people in Delhi now. Why are you taking it out on me? Yeah, that's mountain? what I've always been arguing, that to quench yeah. the thirst of Delhi, you are bring, uh, constructing yes. a Renuka dam in Sirmore and submerging last, if yeah, the yeah, large tracks of water. Why, why are you <laughs> stealing my water? Okay, have, be less thirsty now. <laughs> Spread your people. 
<laughs> so my my uh, my the way we can get over it which i'm suggesting for the all the 11 states yeah. is yeah. that we set up our own institutes of montology now montology is the study of mountains it is a How do you elaborate that that's disease. very interesting that's uh, that's i'm hearing for the first time you know what is montology and so it what... it, it is yeah. a study of mountains done by mountain people mm -hmm. so nobody nowhere is uh, mountain study so tomorrow if i am digging a tunnel in a mountain in utranchal who do i get i get a metro company no? what is the experience where is the, the continental clash? The two continents are meeting. There's a special type of subsoil there. Are you aware of when you're digging metros of all these complications? We have huge machines doing it. So it's a very difficult problem. You don't understand the mountains. So my argument has been that the first, first task of preserving the mountain environment is to set up study centers. I call them the Institutes of Montology, and I'm suggesting that every, all 11 states have their own Institutes of Montology, which are interconnected almost like a university. Now, uh, the kind of things they would study would be physical features. What is a mountain? What is a zone? What is a high zone? What is a low zone? What are the differences? Where should the Romain, be? before 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 you elaborate what they do, I mean, because it just stuck my mind when you said about uh, uh, the whole question of, uh, you know, uh, can we not suggest it in the financial architecture of the 16 Finance Commission? Because that's really coming up. So and, and, you know, disasters are like really on our head. And can we just argue or articulate it in that sense that, look, here's the 16 Finance Commission. So help us in establishing these institutes in respective states. Or you want to keep it just limited to the states and through their fiscal uh, you know, interventions, they will be able to do it. Should we, it no, also no, not be no, a point? I, I'm very clear on this, that the capital expenses and the institutional establishment yeah. is, 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 uh, finances cannot be done by the states. The states yeah. will run it. The states will provide the knowledge base for it. it these are international institutes we are proposing. Yeah. People should come from Switzerland and Austria and, and okay. cross, cross fertilize. Got it. So the center it, has to play it, yeah. a very critical yeah, role. Yeah. Please, yeah. And and what 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 are you what are you arguing for? I mean, what so what we are saying is that let us separate yeah. out, you know, physical features, geological, chemical, biological processes. What is infrastructure? What is horizontal? What is vertical? Mm -hmm. What is the demography? What is the settlement patterns of mm -hmm. these uh, settlements that we have here? We have cultural issues. How do cultures mix in the hill areas? Yeah. Now, what what we will find when we start gathering the knowledge base for mountain montology is that there are huge amounts of studies being made since colonial times of our populations and cultures and the interaction with the uh, flora, fauna. 25% of the biodiversity of India is in the mountains. Yeah. So all of these huge amounts of studies has taken place, but nowhere is it collected as a source of core knowledge about the mountain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 what I had in mind was an idea that the, let's say the Institute of Montology in Utranchal or in, in Gangtok or in Dharamsala, these are great centers which start collecting the experiences, the cultures, the narratives, the stories, the science of the mountains. So that when somebody comes, uh, for, that means we first define our identity in modern times. In modern language, this is our scientific. Idea. This is a state called Uttaranchal or Himachal or um, or Meghalaya. This is our scientific identity. We are not some rural community staying in the past and plowing our fields. No? So we have a scientific base to our identity. So these institutes are very critical for us because they would they would define in the eyes of the nation and in the eyes particularly of the inhabitants of that state that this is who we are today and this is what is we have to prevent happening from us because development uh, economic growth these are like juggernauts and uh, sometimes you wonder who's driving it a lot mm. of people are benefiting from it they, they, are, they are not careful so you can drive a bulldozer in Thar Desert, there's no problem. But if you drive it in Himachal, there are a lot of problems. Absolutely. Yeah. So the juggernaut of growth 
has to have some sense. And, when and that's what I say, come... from the juggernaut of growth, juggernaut of disaster is yet to come. You know, <laughs> once you have some melting of glacier, uh, you know, at top of Satluj, and then the entire muck that has been dumped, then that juggernaut, I don't know how will be. Okay, please, please, so, please go so ahead. So let me, yes, in yes. My, when my, I just, uh, my concluding remarks are in the form of a request to all hill people, to guard their gold mines because a lot of people are after your natural health. In other words, natural assets, they don't care. Let's say that they're not particularly exploiting you, but they're very careless because you are very delicate. You are growing apples, potatoes, in, in farming in between crevices. These are not places you, you need care how you walk in those areas even. Please look after your wealth on your own terms create your own knowledge base. Let the shell be made by the Central Planning Commission. Let the institute be set up. But it is mountain people who have to fill the knowledge into that place. That's a very important thing. And they have to safeguard it. You see, the assets of the mountains are centuries old. I cannot say this about the indo gangetic plain across Haryana, Punjab and I can't say this is centuries old. It's not so. Mm, absolutely true. Yeah. But the mountains of India are centuries old. What they mean, what they represent, what they can offer. So it's very important that these things get looked after by those people who inherited it. Mm. So they have to pass it on to their own children. Everybody is welcome. Tourists are welcome. Everybody is welcome. But not at the cost of those people living there. True. So, um, I hope one of one of my my dreams is that in the Institute of Montology, they will create a new kind of tourism. Mm. Say so, no, 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 no. If you want to come and stay in hotels and watch television, please, no, no, no. This is not for you. This is a place <laughs> yeah. where. Yeah, yeah, you can do it jolly well in Delhi or in any other part. So, yeah, if yeah. you're coming all the way to the mountains, let yeah. us tell you what you can do. Have yeah, you ever about about our water? food, about our culture. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Have you true. ever tasted pure water? Here is a stream. Yeah. Here yeah. is a spring. Just taste it. Because you haven't yeah. all your life tasted pure water. Yeah. Have you seen some pure air? Have you seen the sky blue? Yeah. So these are the assets which the institute as a study of tourism, etc. will start producing and give a new consciousness mm -hmm. okay. to the relationship between the mountains and the Physical relationship in terms of the ecology and mental relationship in terms of people who cross and mix with each other. But Rumi, I have a question, maybe the last question that I want. I mean, it's yes. fascinating to talk to you and, and I would like to talk for another hour or so. Maybe we have another uh, discussion that's coming up with you on, on another platform. But my point is, you know, this whole key of development that has been like uh, put on our... Uh, uh, on our keyboard uh, uh, that uh, look if you do not have hydropower I mean you know if you do not have a tourism how will you sustain uh, so you know that's how if you do not have roads you know how would you bring your crops the, the diversification that you've done to the market so that's generally an argument I don't buy that argument by the way uh, so how do you place uh, this argument in the overall discussion or in the overall ambit of what we've been discussing about this? Let, let us uh, just very briefly, let me ask you a very fundamental question. Hmm. Uh, why do we make a parallel between human growth and human wealth? Hmm. Why okay. does wealth have to mean human development. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have arrived at after 75 years of independence, of economic growth, of great progress, we have perhaps simplified too much what human development means. We have suddenly, we have suddenly made it equivalent of savings and how much money you have. Mm -hmm. In fact, it is narrowly, narrowly confined to money accumulation. Actually, yeah, that's true. I, I'm glad you brought this whole, yeah, concept now, of money the issue yeah. before us will be, you know, what what part of our life should be devoted to accumulating money 
what part of our life should be devoted to looking after our quality of life mm -hmm. without money? Mm -hmm. So if I say uh, to a person, uh, if I meet a person walking on the mall in Simla and I say, you don't look as if you come from the mountain. He says, I come from Andhra. I said, why? He says, I couldn't stand life in Andhra. I have come to live in Simla. <laughs> true, true. How many people have you met like that? Yeah, yeah. quite so a number then, of them. Yeah. So there are, there are, there are yeah. people who value the quality of life. I'm making mm. a distinction here. So first we need to separate out our awareness about quality of life and not make mm. it completely subservient to money saving. Mm. Can okay. I be have less money and better air? Mm. So these are decisions that individually people have to make, but also the government. Mm. Also the government. The government yeah, has to give the awareness that it's everything is not about taxing money. Mm. Great. See? Yeah, thank you, Rami, for uh, yes, uh, sparing the time. And I think that's the two or three very important uh, points that have come out of this discussion. Thank One, for the first time, is the Institute of Ontology. I mean, you've, you've never heard of it. You know, and uh, uh, treating forests as not uh, some, not from the perspective of utility, but as gold mines and how it's important to manage the own assets. And I think also the last point that... At the end of the day, I mean, in this whole uh, race of uh, uh, blatant or rapid development that we talk about, we end up actually gaining nothing. We end up like Kinor, if I tell you, Romi, I mean, Kinor every third day gets blocked because we have landslides. The projects are almost done there, but still the landslides are continuing because of the inherent disturbance that uh, we have done to the rock, rock formations there. So, yeah, I think thank you so much. And... Uh, uh, I hope that we are able to uh, bring in some churning, you know, some kind of discussion across the mountain states. And we are going to have this very interesting mountain conference taking place in Delhi soon on the 4th and 5th, where I'm sure this interview would also be one of the precursors or one of the uh, triggers or a catalyst to, you know, think beyond uh, beyond the limits that we are generally given. Thank you so much. It's been a lovely uh, and, and one one concluding thought I would leave you with. Please, please remember please. the mountains are alive. Jeeva. Mountains are alive. <laughs> thanks. Thanks.